All right, so we are in chapter 19, Special Senses. This is the final chapter as a part of this unit. Um, so your lecture exam will be on Thursday. That'll open up at 7 p.m. And I will leave it open until Friday at midnight. I'll give you two hours to do it. It's 100 questions. You can go back and forth between the questions. It's all multiple choice. And we'll go over the study guide for that after we get through chapter 19. We also have a quiz tonight at 8 p.m. on nervous system structures, but we'll get started with chapter 19, special senses. Um, you have many special senses and we're gonna focus on your hearing and your eye. And those two I've included in your notes, pictures that you can label if you, if you want as we're working through this. Okay, so our bodies are constantly exposed to sensory information and we call all of this sensory information uh, a stimuli or stimulus. And sensation is our conscious awareness to this stimulus or the stimuli. Uh, stimuli are detected by receptors throughout the body. And these are receptors for general senses such as temperature, pain, touch, stretch, and pressure. A lot of those are in your skin. And then we have special senses with, which are gustation, which is tasting, olfaction is hearing, vision is seeing, uh, equilibrium also has to do with hearing. So both of those are kind of um, set up for in your ear. So that is a stimulus. And I think your first part of your notes, I just leave you some blanks to write down some in, anything about a stimulus that you want to. Um, sensory receptors are structures that detect stimuli. They can be structurally complex sense organs such as the eye or the ear, which is what we're gonna go over or very simple endings of single neurons, such as just uh, endings of dendrites and the tips of your fingers. These receptors act as transducers, so they take that stimulus and then they convert it into another form of energy. So for example, when we get to your eye, you have visual receptors in the back of your eye that change light energy that enters into your eye into electrical impulses um, that your optic nerve takes to your brain. Uh, properties of these receptors. Receptors have receptive fields, and these are areas through which their sensitive ends are distributed. It can be a very small receptive field, such as in the tip of your finger, where you would have many um, neurons or dendrite endings, or it can be a larger receptive field where it's more spread out, such as in your back or your neck. And it's really fun to do um, lab experiments with this. You have a partner touch you on or make a point on the back of your neck or your back. And then you try to follow where that person put that point on your back to see if you can mimic the exact location. And you'll see that there's a much lower density of receptors on your back and your neck. So it's hard for you to pinpoint exactly where they touched you versus your fingers are a lot more sensitive. Um, so that's kind of a fun activity to do if we were together in person. Uh, classification of receptors. Is this what that says? I can never see the top of my screen. There we go. Um, general sense receptors are distributed throughout the skin. Special sense receptors are in the complex organs in the head. Uh, there's three criteria we use to describe receptors, how they're distributed, um, what stimulates them or that origin, and then the modality of stimulus. And we'll talk about what that means. Somatic receptors are found in your skin, your mucous membranes, lining body cavities, joints, muscles, and tendons. Um, and these will monitor a variety of stimuli, including texture, pressure, temperature, pain, vibration, and stretch. Then you have visceral receptors. Whenever you see the word visceral, that has to do with internal um, lining of organs or blood vessels. So these receptors will detect stretch, changes in chemical concentrations of the blood, if they're in the blood vessels, temperature and pain. And then your special sense receptors, those are the complex sense organs, um, your eyes, your ears, um, the, the taste buds on your tongue, things like that. Okay, here are stimulus origin. You should know what external receptors are and what internal receptors are. External receptors detect stimuli from the external environment and internal receptors detect stimuli in the internal organs. 
So these are just receptors based on where the stimulus is originating. Proprioceptors detect stimuli pertaining to body, body position. Remember we've talked about proprioception, the, I, I, the ability of your body to know where the body parts are in relation to each other. So these are the three types of receptors if we describe um, what stimulus and where it originates from, either on the outside, the inside of the body, or pertaining to body position. Then the modality of stimulus. Um, this is where, yeah, there are five of them here. Yeah, so if here, if you wanna, um, what, this is kind of your first question in your notes. The five modalities of stimuli, here are the five of them. Um, chemoreceptors um, detect specific molecules, chemical molecules dissolved in fluid. That might be a test question, what a chemoreceptor does. Thermoreceptors detect changes in temperature. Photoreceptors detect changes in intensity, color, position of light. And mechanoreceptors detect touch, pressure, vibration, and stretch. Mechanoreceptors might be a test question too, but I think I have you guys just understand these modalities which depend on the stimulating agent um, that will stimulate the receptor. Uh, a baroreceptor is a specific type of receptor that detects pressure changes, specifically blood pressure changes. Um, there's a big one in your aorta. And then the nociceptors detect anything painful that you might feel or touch. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about phantom pain and referred pain. These are clinically significant examples of pain itself. Um, you should know what these are or what referred pain is because you'll probably have to deal with this in your health care related fields in the future. Um, phantom pain is a sensation associated with a part of the body that has been removed. So this occurs a lot of time with amputees. Um, we call that phantom limb syndrome. So if they've lost a limb or it needed to be amputated for some reason, um, the end of the neuron has been cut off, but the rest of the neuron still exists in the upper parts of the body that are still there. So the excitation of a central nervous system neuron that was formerly excited by a limb that was cut off, um, it's, it still can be interpreted as pain in that limb. And that just has to be the craziest thing to feel if you are an amputee. Um, so common, uh, obviously, with soldiers, but you might run into that in your clinical experiences. Or referred pain occurs when impulses from certain viscera are perceived as originating not from the organ, but in a dermatone of the skin. And you've probably heard of this if you have a heart attack. Um, it may be referred to dermatomes T1 to T5, and I'll show you what that means here. Um, so if we look at sources of referred pain, why does this happen? Why do you feel pain in a part of your body, but it's not originating from there? It's coming from a totally different part of your body. It's because if you look at this picture, and I'll try to use my cursor, um, let's say the wall of your appendix, this axon of this sensory neuron follows the same pathway as the sensory axon that's coming from your pain receptor near your belly button. So because they follow the same pathway and the synapse and the ganglia follow the same sensory pathway to the brain, you might have referred pain in your belly button region, even though there's something actually going wrong with your appendix. So these dermatones of the skin, I think I show you here, these are um, the dermatones of the skin are places in the body that medical doctors have assigned to portions of your skin that refer to places where nerves will gather sensory information from them. So this is showing how sensory information that is coming from the heart would also be uh, possibly referred to as coming anywhere down the left side of the arm. Uh, so that's why you've probably heard a common sign of a heart attack is pain radiating down your left arm because the sensory neurons that follow the pathway up to your brain are following that same pathway as the sensory neurons that are coming from your heart. Uh, so this shows other areas of referred pain, stomach, pancreas, appendix is your belly button. So this is just important to know if you're an ER nurse, an ER, PA, whatever, a doc, and someone comes to you and is complaining of pain in their left arm, maybe they're undergoing a heart attack along with other symptoms.
So that's referred pain. I wish I could see your faces so we could like converse. This is just not as fun as it is in class. Um, sensory receptors, so these are tactile, I think, receptors, yep. These are sensory receptors that respond to touch. Um, they're touch and pressure receptors. Maybe you guys remember me talking about Meisner's corpuscles and Pacinian corpuscles back when we were doing histology. These are just deep uh, touch and pressure receptors located in the skin that respond to touch. And those are tactile or touch receptors. Okay, gustation is the sense of taste. Uh, gustatory cells are taste receptors and they're housed in special organs we call taste buds. And taste buds are located on the dorsal surface of the tongue, uh, which is the part that feels bumpy, in epithelial and connective tissue elevations called papilla. So the bumps that you feel on your tongue are the papilla and the taste buds are located within those um, kind of bumps or within those papilla. There's four types of papillae, sorry, papillae for plural, papilla is singular, a uh, filiform, fungiform, valate, and foliate papilla. And you should have a general understanding of what the four types of papilla are. Um, I'll give you some helpful hints to remember what they are, but filiform papilla, um, has small numerous bumps that actually lack taste buds. So filiform papilla are numerous, so they fill up your tongue, but they don't have any taste buds. The fungiform papilla are mushroom-shaped buds on the tips and the sides of your tongue. Those contain a few taste buds, but those are found on like the tips and the sides of your tongue. Valate are round bumps arranged in a V, kind of on the posterior back of your tongue. They contain many taste buds, and then foliate papilla are just subtle ridges on the posterior lateral surface of the tongue, housing a few taste buds. You should really know fungiform papilla. Hint, hint with that one. Okay, each taste bud is composed of numerous cells. Um, you don't really need to know a lot about this, but it's just interesting to see. You should know I put a little asterisk here um, in the elderly, elderly, their taste buds are actually decreasing in number and also decreasing in sensitivity. So not only are they, the elderly losing taste buds on their tongue, but the taste buds that are left, um, they're not as sensitive anymore. Okay, this is just a look at a taste bud and where the different taste buds are formed or found, fungiform, filiform. You can see how filiform look a little different. Um, and they, excuse me, these are for the papilla and filiform don't have many taste buds with them. Foliate, fungiform, and then valate are kind of found in this back region of your tongue. You can see here how each taste bud is kind of embedded within the little bump of the papilla. And here are the cells that make up the taste bud itself. It's kind of interesting to see. Uh, you have five different taste sensations. This is also fun to do in lab, taste the different parts of your tongue that have these sensations. Um, you have a sweet sensation, salt, sour, bitter, and an umami, like uh, detecting amino acids or proteins. So those are the five taste, sens taste sensations that you can taste. Olfaction is the sense of smell. Um, anything that you smell is called an odorant. It's dissolved in your mucus of your nasal cavity. It's not as sensitive in humans compared to many other organs. So I know dogs, dogs are, they don't have a very good, um, they're colorblind, right? Are dogs completely colorblind or just kind of? Are they, I think? I think they're completely colorblind. I think so too, I, yeah. I hate making statements that I'm not completely sure of, but yeah, they're either slightly or completely. So dogs make up for that in their sense of smell. Okay, um, a little bit more about sense of smell. There's an olfactory epithelium. You notice I don't have a whole lot on olfaction in your notes. So don't worry too much about olfaction, um, but it's the sense of smell. Here's a look at odorants that would come in from a nice cup of coffee and how these odorants are detected by your olfactory nerves that travel through the cribiform plate and reach up and touch this olfactory nerve. 
Remember your olfactory nerve is cranial nerve number one. It's the most anterior cranial nerve because it reaches out and touches those um, olfactory nerves that will travel into your nose to help you smell. All right, um, let's skip this video for now. You guys can watch this on your own. Oh, it's just an eye anatomy video. That'll help you maybe with some of the structures in lab, but just for the sake of time to get through um, this lecture and the study, I'll um, skip that video for now. So the eyes and the ears are what we're really gonna spend the rest of the time talking about. And these are the complex sense organs. We focus on eyes and ears because this is what you guys will focus on in physiology which I just found out I'm gonna teach a section of physiology next semester, but you don't have to take me because it'll be my first time teaching it. Um, and I don't know where you guys are gonna take physiology, but um, so we focus on eyes and ears and anatomy because you guys will focus on um, hearing and vision and physiology a lot. So eyes have photoreceptors that help form visual images of the environment and then anything accessory stru structures to the eye protect the eye against foreign objects and ensure the eye that the surface remains clean and moist. So some accessory structures that you have in the eye are external structures. You have eyebrows, eyelashes, eyelids, um, eyebrows prevent sweat from dripping in, eyelashes help anything foreign from getting into your eye, and then eyelids can close extremely rapidly to again try to keep foreign objects out of your eye. Um, the medial and lateral palpebra commissures are the corners of the eye. The palpebral fissure is the space between the eyelids when your eyelids close. And then if you notice the little, I guess I could just put my face up to the screen. I don't want to do that. The lacrimal caruncle is the medial pink bump containing ciliary glands that produce a gritty secretion. Sometimes when you're sick or when you wake up in the morning, you'll notice that pink um, gritty uh, secretion. Okay, so these are some of the external structures of the eye. So they are listed there, but I really want to focus on internal structures of the eye. So this is a sagittal section. Um, there's some accessory structures still shown there in a sagittal view. Uh, if we start to look in the eye, you can see that the outer surface of the eye is the cornea. And this is the part that's kind of shaped like a contact lens that you would put a contact in. The cornea will focus light through the pupil. So the pupil is just the hole in your eye and that's the black part. And the pupil brings light in through the lens and the lens is the circular disc-like structure behind the pupil. It will be controlled by muscles and the lens can flatten or bulge to try to um, focus objects to the back of the eye. In the back of the eye, you can see where your cranial nerve number two, your optic nerve attaches as well. Okay, so the lacrimal apparatus, what is that? That produces, collects and drains lacrimal fluid tears from the eye. Tears are important for lubricating the interior surface of the eye, they keep it clean. Um, it has a specific enzyme called lysozyme in the tears and that just helps to prevent bacterial infection. So here's your lacrimal apparatus. The tears are made in the lacrimal gland. And if you remember, the facial nerve helps increase lacrimal gland secretion. So the lacrimal gland produces tears that are constantly washing over your eye and then they will be drained through this nasolacrimal duct mm -hmm. and they'll drain into your nose or your nasal cavity. So that's when you're, you're crying, if you're crying, um, you might need a Kleenex as well because those excess tears are being drained and coming out of your nose. So that's the lacrimal apparatus. Then I get a little bit about the eye itself. Um, it's about two and a half centimeters in diameter. It's almost spherical. You have fat cushions that help to protect the eye around it. The anterior cavity is the part of your eyeball in front of the lens. And this will contain what we call aqueous humor. And aqueous humor is a lot more um, liquid. And then the posterior cavity is behind the lens and that contains a little bit more permanent vitreous humor. Think of like jello, like substance is behind the lens. There are three layers of the eye wall. 
And these are the three layers. It's the fibrous tunic, the vascular tunic, and then the retina is the innermost layer. And we'll go through those layers and what's involved in each too. So the fibrous tunic is the outermost layer of the eye. It's made of the sclera, which is the white part of your eye. So that's what we can see in each other, just the whites of your eyes. And then it continues on as the cornea, which is clear. So you can't see your cornea, but it covers over the iris and pupil. And then the vascular tunic, we call it vascular because it contains all of your vasculature. So your blood vessels, your arteries and your veins. And the vascular tunic, it consists of the iris and the iris is the colored part of your eye. It also consists of what we call the ciliary body. And the ciliary body involves a muscle that has little suspensory ligaments in white here that help to control the shape of the lens. And then the choroid layer is just this inner pink layer extending out and around that makes up that middle vascular layer of the eye. So the layer of the eye that has arteries and veins in it. Uh, the third innermost layer of the eye is the retina. There's two layers of the retina, pigmented layer and neural layer, and we'll talk about those. And the retina is the innermost layer of the eye. This will be where you have um, photoreceptors or um, the receptors for taking in any sort of vision um, images and then focusing them on the back of the brain. Just looking for, sorry about that, okay. Okay, so the fibrous tunic, this is your cornea, your sclera. I'm trying to, in your notes, I have you list a defining feature of the following eye structures. The cornea is transparent, it's avascular, it receives oxygen and nutrients from lacrimal fluid. Um, so the cornea is just the outer covering, it's where you put a contact lens, it's completely transparent. The sclera makes up the majority, this is considered the white part of the eye. Specifically, I put an asterisk next to the sclera. It provides shape to your eye and it also protects the internal parts of the eye. So that's what you should know about sclera. It's made of dense irregular connective tissue. Um, the choroid is just what we call the vast network of capillaries. Um, the ciliary body is composed of ciliary muscles and processes that just change the shape of your lens. And the shape of the lens changes as you focus images um, on the back of your eye. The iris controls your pupil size. So the iris is the colored part of your eye. I don't know what guys colored eyes you guys have, but there's blue, there's green, there's brown. I think those are the most common. Um, I almost said pink. I feel like I have, everything's pink because I'm with my girls today, but no one has pink eyes unless you have contact lenses that are colored. Anyway, the iris is not just color, but it's also actually a muscle. And it has a circular and a radial muscle to it. And those muscles help control your pupil size. So when your pupils constrict in bright, like if you're looking at a bright light, your pupils will constrict. And that is the iris constricting them. Your pupils will dilate if it's really dark out to try to take in as much of your surroundings as possible. And that's the iris dilating your eyes. So the iris controls pupil size. So a little more interior of your eye. Here you can see your cornea, your sclera is the white part. Your iris is this large circular disc. It can, again, it can bulge out or it can be nice and flat, depending on if you're focusing on something near and far. Um, in pink, you can see the choroid layer and then it, how it ends in the ciliary body, which involves the muscle and processes that will control um, the shape of the lens. The iris colored part that surrounds the pupil, which is just a hole that allows light to get through, but it's completely black. As we look at kind of the back side of your eye, you can see choroid layer and how the retina has two separate layers. If we focus on the back of your eye, first of all, we're in the posterior cavity. And the posterior cavity, again, contains that gel-like fluid called vitreous humor, whereas the anterior chamber contains a lot more just liquid-type fluid. Um, in the back part of the eye, we have what we call the fovea centralis. 
And this is where your eyeball will naturally um, adjust to try to focus images in the fovea centralis. So when you're reading a page from a book, your eyeballs are constantly adjusting to try to focus those words back on the fovea centralis because that fovea contains the most what we call cones. And that's a type of photoreceptor that helps you see um, in visual acuity. The optic disc is the area that we call where the optic nerve attaches. So you can see cranial nerve number two, the optic nerve has um, arteries and veins in it. But where the optic nerve attaches is the eye's blind spot. Because of the arteries and nerves coming out of this optic disc area, coming from the optic nerve, there are no photoreceptors um, in this optic disc. So each of your eyes have a blind spot in them. And I'm gonna show you an example of that that you can test um, for your blind spot in your eye. Okay, let's keep going from here. So pupillary constriction and dilation, this shows how the different muscles, whether it's the, um, which mus muscle in the iris will um, constrict your pupils and dilate your pupils. Uh, so this is why if you've been pulled over for drinking, if you've been inebriated, um, the cop shines the light in your eye because in normal dark darkness, because most people are drinking and dr driving drunk at night, your eyes will be dilated. So the cop will shine the light in your eye to see if your eyes or your pupils will constrict when that bright light touches them. If your pupils do not constrict when he shines the flashlight in your eye, that just means there's something going up with your brain and probably alcohol's affected it. Um, so that's where the cop shining the light in your eye comes from. He's checking to make sure your pupils will constrict with that bright light. Okay. Do you guys remember which, which part of the autonomic nervous system caused pupil dilation? Sympathetic or parasympathetic? What do you guys think? Parasympathetic? No. I said double check. Sympathetic, right? It's sympathetic. So eye dilation, so your eyes getting bigger, your pupils getting larger, is a sympathetic nervous system response. That's a fight or flight response because when your eyes dilate, they're trying to take in as much um, awareness from their surroundings as possible. Parasympathetic would be a pupil constriction. Okay. Keep going here. Thanks, Enrique. You got it. So the retina are, has two layers to it, the pigmented layer and the neural layer. The pigmented layer is just attached to the choroid layer, which lies right below it. The neural layer is what I want you guys to know. Again, I put a little asterisk next to this. And why is the neural layer important? Because in that neural layer, this layer receives light and converts energy into nerve impulses. And we'll talk about kind of a little bit how that does. We don't have to know about the aura serrata, but those are the two layers of the retina. Specifically know that the neural layer receives light and converts energy into nerve impulses. So here's a structure of the retina. You can see the retina's two layers here. And again, the place where the optic nerve attaches to the back of the eye, we call that the optic disc, because that's the place where arteries and veins are coming out of, and there are no photoreceptors in that spot. Um, this is another look at the retina, even more zoomed in. If you can focus on these photoreceptor cells, there's different cells in the retina, but the photoreceptor cells that we'll talk about are rods and cones. And they're the photoreceptor cells that help with visual acuity and seeing in dim light. And we'll talk about those differences. Really simply put, we won't go through this now, you'll learn it in physiology, but incoming light comes in it touches the back of your eye right away in kind of this pigmented layer. And then your rods and cones pick up that light and send impulses through bipolar cells and ganglia cells back uh, to reach these axons of these ganglion cells that will take it to the optic nerve. 
So I kind of, light goes in and then it kind of bounces back to be taken to the optic nerve for processing by the brain. I'll look underneath the light microscope of the rods and cones and the different layers of the retina. So here are our photoreceptor cells. So these are the three layers in the neural layer of the retina. I just want you guys to focus on the photoreceptor cells. Um, this is the outermost layer. It contains rods and cones. And you should know what each is important for. So rods are important in dim light and cones are important for precise vision and color. So your rods help you see in a dimly lit room and cones kind of help you the rest of the time. They help you see, read, precision, color. You have different types of cones. So this is where color blindness comes in. If some people's cones are not totally functioning right, and many people are just slightly colorblind. They can't see reds or blues, or they see the colors, but in different hues. And that's a problem with their cones, the photoreceptors in their eye. Okay. The optic disc is a blind spot on the retina, lacking photoreceptors. Um, sorry for the traffic. And the fovea centralis, you should also know, is a depression in the retina that contains the highest proportion of cones and almost no rods. And again, cones help with visual acuity. So your fovea centralis will be the airiest of sharpest vision. So when you're trying to focus on something you're reading, your eye will naturally adjust itself. Um, so it's receiving the images of what you're trying to look at and focusing it back on the fovea centralis where you'll have the highest proportion of cones. It's located within what we call the macula lutea. Um, so the fovea centralis is about the size of the end of your pen. And the macula lutea is just a depression kind of that holds the fovea centralis within it. These both will be lateral to your optic disc. So here's a look um, at an ophthalmic view of the retina, which is what your eye doctors would look at to make sure your retina is um, not detached at all. But you can see here the fovea centralis right in the center. It's just lateral to the optic disc. Again, where you see all these blood vessels coming out of because that's where your optic nerve is attached. And the fovea centralis just lies in an area or a depression called the macula lutea. We talked about a blind spot, which is in the optic disc. This is a test on the right that you can test to check your blind spot. It's hard to do on a PowerPoint, um, but how to check for this is you, if you would close your right eye and focus on, um, so hold your right eye closed, focus on the plus sign, and then bring this screen or a piece of paper to your face. Eventually there'll become a point, maybe several inches in front of your eye where the circle will disappear from view. So just focus on the positive and the circle will disappear from view as you bring this closer to your face. And that just shows you where the blind spot exists within your vision. And you can test both eyes for that. You'll probably do that test in physiology lab. I'm not sure. I guess I'll find out next semester along with you. Okay. So this is another one we can kind of do on our own, but eventually if you focus on the red dot, I'm not trying to hypnotize you. If you focus on the red dot in the center of the green circle and just focus on it for several seconds, tell me what happens to the green line eventually or the green circle. Just this, it disappears. So that's what we call adaptation and we get to that in a little bit. So this is just a test that shows how your receptors throughout your body, not just in your eyes, will adapt to stimuli. So if you're constantly being bombarded by a stimulus, eventually your body like turns it off and forgets about it to try to focus its energy on other parts. So if you focus on that red dot, eventually the green circle will disappear. Uh, your brain has kind of tried to turn off that those stimuli that it's receiving, and that's called adaptation. Okay, a little more about the eye. So the lens, we'll get through this. We're almost done with this here. Um, it's that deformable structure. It's held behind the pupil by suspensory ligaments. 
the suspensory ligaments are eventually um, attached to the ciliary muscles of that ciliary body. And the lens changes shape as you're focusing on near and far vision. Um, to accommodate, to look at something close, your parasympathetic fibers excite the ciliary muscle, the muscle contracts, and the lens becomes more spherical. So um, accommodation, when your lens becomes more spherical, that helps you look at something close up. And we say accommodation gets bad as you get older, you lose the ability for your um, lens to become more spherical. It wants to stay flat because those muscles aren't working very well anymore. And that's why when you're older, you might have to wear um, reading glasses to help look at something close. Okay, this is showing how the lens changes shape as you're focusing on something far away and also close up. Um, I won't have you guys know how that works, but just know that the lens changes shape. Okay, anterior and posterior cavity, um, whether it's in front of the lens or behind the lens, it's, they're both filled with fluid. Um, the anterior cavity is really filled with fluid to try to help cleanse the eye. And the posterior cavity, that fluid is a little more permanent and gel-like to try to give more shape to the eyeball itself. Um, this is a great quiz. It's on sporkle.com if you guys want to try to do this in preparation for your next lab exam of labeling an eye and practicing with that quiz. Okay, are we good with going on to the ear? Any questions? Okay. I know we're kind of going through this fast, but that's because it's, yeah, we're going to get through the study guide too. And if you guys need to like get out at all at any time, you can always enter back in. Um, at any time you want. And I'll post these both again on YouTube in separate videos if you want to look at them later. Okay, so the ear. We'll end with the ear. Um, this is the organ of equilibrium and hearing. It's divided into three distinct anatomic regions, the external ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. Oops. And as we work our way, we'll start in the external ear. You can see the oracle is what makes up kind of the ear flap itself. So we all have different shapes to our oracles. The oracle just acts as a funnel to funnel sound in through your external acoustic meatus. And that's what we would call the ear canal where you probably stick a tooth or a Q-tip, but you probably shouldn't. Um, not far down in the external acoustic meatus, we get to the tympanic membrane, which is your eardrum. So that makes up your external ear, just the oracle, the external acoustic meatus, and that tympanic membrane. Um, the tympanic membrane is like a drum. It vibrates when sound will hit it. And those vibrations get passed on into structures of the middle ear. And the middle ear, we call this cavity the tympanic cavity, which is the area right behind the um, tympanic membrane, and there's tiny little bones in the middle ear called the malleus, incus, and stapes. These little bones that my cursor are on, these are the tiniest bones in your body. And if you would put them all side by side, they wouldn't even fill up um, the diameter of a penny. So they don't even come close to filling up the size of a penny. So we call them auditory ossicles, tiny bones, um, the vibrations that enter through the tympanic membrane will vibrate the malleus, incus, and stapes. Because these bones are so small, it's, it's a physical, physiological phenomenon. They will um, enlarge or expound on those vibrations several times, and those vibrations will be greatly kind of grown as they're passed through the stapes. The stapes is, looks like a stirrup if you've ridden a horse or a saddle from a horse. And the stirrup kind of like vibrates against what we call an oval window. And it's just a thin structure that will lead into the inner ear structure. And we call this inner ear structure, the semicircular canals are three fluid filled canals that help with equilibrium and balance. The vestibule is this area kind of right in the middle that those vibrations will go through first. And then the cochlea is a wound up snail-like structure of a, like a long tube that these vibrations will go through. These vibrations in, within the semicircular canals 
and the cochlea. There's fluid in there and the vibrations pass through that fluid. They bend hair cells within your cochlea and the bending of those hair cells are picked up by um, the vestibular cochlear nerve, which is another cranial nerve that brings those sensations to the brain. And that's how you hear. Um, the auditory tube is this structure. It empties into your nasopharynx, which we will learn about when we talk about the digestive system as well. Um, but the auditory tube helps to equalize pressure. So when you're in an airplane, when you're up at high altitude, your tympanic membrane kind of pops out of place as pressure builds up within your middle and inner ear. And the auditory tube, because it's connected kind of to the outside world in your nose, um, it allows, this, allows pressure to equalize and your tympanic membrane pops back into place when pressure equalizes. And that popping that you hear is just your tympanic membrane kind of popping back into place. I know that was a lot of information there. You should know, and we'll go through this in detail now. Another ear anatomy video that you can watch. Um, so your auricle, skin covered, funnel shaped. The auricle leads to the bony tube called the external acoustic meatus, which ends at your eardrum, the tympanic membrane. Um, glands produce a wax-like secretion called cerumen. Uh, wax is good in your ear because it helps keep out anything harmful. Um, so unless you're having trouble hearing or unless it's like pouring out of your ears, um, get a doctor or a medical professional to take it out because you don't want to harm your tympanic membrane or pop it with a Q-tip. Uh, the middle ear contains an air-filled tympanic cavity. So it's filled with air. It's just medial to the tympanic membrane itself. The auditory tube connects the middle ear to the nasopharynx, and the auditory ossicles are teeny tiny bones that transmit sound waves to the inner ear. You should know these bones from lateral to medial or medial to lateral. You should just know which one comes first. Uh, the malleus is what is attached to the tympanic membrane. The incus is the bone that's in the middle, and the stapes is the bone that looks like a stirrup that's attached to your incus and your oval window that leads to your inner ear. Um, two small muscles will contract to restrict ossicle movement if something potentially damaging um, were to occur. So if you're at a really loud concert or you're next to a jet engine, you have muscles that'll like keep the ossicles from vibrating so much uh, to keep damage from occurring. So this is your middle ear. Um, your middle ear is within your temporal bone as well as your inner ear. So up in this upper left-hand picture, you can see that your middle ear and inner ear are both housed within your temporal bone. So again, we have our malleus. Um, uh, the word mallet, it looks like a little tiny hammer. The incus is the bone in the middle, and then your stapes is this one attached to the oval window. And then you can see the auditory tube, again, is this tube leading into uh, your nasal cavity or your nasal pharynx, which is just the back of your nose. Uh, the inner ear is located also within the temporal bone. Um, the cavities in the bone make up the bony labyrinth, um, and that's also known as your semicircular canals. So the semicircular canals is your bony labyrinth. And within the bony labyrinth are fluid-filled tubes and spaces called a membranous labyrinth. Um, this gets a little into a little detail, so you don't have to know all of this. There's different um, names for the fluid found in the bony and membranous labyrinth, and this fluid is what those sound vibrations will go through. So here are your semicircular canals, the bony labyrinth. So again, bony labyrinth is also known as semicircular canals. Here's what we call the vestibule. It's made of structures called the utricle and saccule, which help with equilibrium and balance in your head as you're spinning around in a circle. If you love those rides at amusement parks, I never did. Um, or if you are playing with your kids and they make you turn around 10 times in their hopscotch game, this will help you maintain your equilibrium. And then you have the cochlea here is this snail-like structure. 
I won't get into this too much here, but the cochlea will, um, if we unwind the cochlea and take a cross section of it, we have these spaces within the cochlea above and below, kind of if we would cut or to cut it in half. And within these spaces, we have what we call the spiral organ. And this, within this organ is where you have hair cells that will bend to responses in vibrations within the fluid. And the bending of those hair cells are picked up by this, what you see a spiral ganglion or a nerve. And those bending of the hair cells due to sound coming into your ear will be passed on to your vestibular cochlear nerve to your brain. And that's kind of how hearing occurs, a really simplified version. So the cochlea is the inner ear for hearing. Um, there's a cochlear duct, and then you have two chambers that surround the cochlear duct. The scala vestibuli is the chamber above it, and the scala tympani is below it. Um, this is just an, another in-depth version of vision of this, um, of the cochlea. So again, we're looking at that snail-like structure. If we unwind it and just take one tube and then take a cross-section of it, when we look at what's inside, you would have a, um, the scala vestibuli on the top and the scala tympani on the bottom with this spiral organ in between the two where the bending of those hair cells will produce um, sound stimuli that gets sent to your brain. Okay, this is the process of hearing. We kind of already talked a little bit about this. Um, I'll let you guys read through this on your own. You don't necessarily need to know this process because you'll learn it in physiology. Um, so this is the process of hearing, and this is the sound path that hearing takes as it travels through. The external acoustic meatus vibrates your tympanic membrane, goes through your ossicles. The stapes kind of bumps up and down against this oval window and then these vibrations travel around the cochlea and eventually the vibrations have to go somewhere and they'll enter out or the pressure from those vibrations will enter out the round window. So that's a really simplified version of the process of hearing. A little bit of frequency of sound then, and I'll, that's kind of all we have for the ear. Um, frequency of sound is the number of sound waves per unit of time, and this is measured in hertz, so this corresponds to the pitch, and loudness refers to the intensity of sound, and this is measured in decibels. Um, basically, the more loud a sound is, they'll stimulate more hair cells to bend, which cause higher rates of nerve impulses on your cochlear nerve. Here's a sound wave interpretation of the basilar membrane. Um, the basilar membrane is just a bottom kind of boundary between those chambers within the cochlea. And something that's interesting is a cochlear implant you might have heard of. Um, usually they place a transmitter outside of the ear and then put in a lead or antenna that will travel through the cochlea to bypass areas of the cochlea that are not being able to be stimulated by sound waves. And that transmitter will eventually stimulate the vestibular cochlear nerve, which will help transmit any sound back to the brain. And that is chapter 19.